So the mechanics of Pokemon breeding are a little odd. In this video, I will attempt to detangle this mess and rationalize it into something that makes some sense with our world's mechanics. So what solid things can we ascertain from how breeding works? Most Pokemon have sex. Well, they call it gender, but it's clearly a misnomer for sex. And there are two sexes, which can reproduce with each other. There are also Pokemon, which are sexless, which we'll get to. For each species that has sex, there's a sex ratio, which is effectively the odds that a given member is male or female. And it isn't always 50-50, which... <sighs> so the fact that almost every Dioecious, as in two sexed, species has a 50-50 sex ratio in real life isn't a coincidence or some innate aspect of our biology. It's just kind of a mathematical consequence of natural selection. If there are fewer of one sex, adaptations which make one's offspring more likely to be that sex will be beneficial as they'll usually have a better chance of finding a mate. It creates a natural balancing of the sexes, at least at birth. Skewed ratios do come about in real life, it's just that when they do, there is a specific reason for it. Post-birth factors like parental resource allocation or differing sexual behaviors that result in differing mortality rates can shift them. Sequential hermaphrodites, or species which start out as one sex and switch to the other, can have ratios very skewed to the first sex. There's also environmental factors that can have an impact, like how the sex of baby turtles is determined by the temperature their eggs are incubated at, or in a less direct way, how many members of Hymenoptera are able to control the sex of their young either to simply adapt to what's needed in the environment, or to facilitate the wealths of drones that you social species make use of. All of these could theoretically explain a shifted ratio, but they don't quite work in this situation, mainly because the ratios we see are both in the wild and at birth, meaning that post-birth factors in sequential hermaphrodites are off the table. And if it were environmental factors or some amount of choice was involved, then we'd expect to see some variation between different areas, but it's always the same. That doesn't technically rule it out as an option, but it does mean there's no evidence for it. It seems that whatever causes these ratios is both at birth and not malleable, it's consistent everywhere. There's probably some weird animal who can be used to explain this, but the point is this isn't normal, at least not on this scale. Oh, and no matter how we explain things, species with a 100% sex ratio make 0% sense. You can't have a species with one sex without asexual or hermaphroditic reproduction, which we don't see. Well, that's the case in animals. Animal species being able to viably reproduce outside of their species isn't a common thing. Genetic incompatibility is a major aspect of speciation. But for Pokemon, hybrids are completely viable, and most Pokemon can reproduce with a large number of other Pokemon. This means that if a species doesn't have an even sex ratio, then they can supplement that with the other sex of a different species within their egg group. Well, at least the females can. Oh, egg groups, yeah. Well, they're absurdly large and mostly stupid as hell. And I don't just mean because they encapsulate a wide range of diversity. Let's look at some highlights. Oh, the flying egg group. It's got birds, that makes sense. Birds are a massive clade, but giving them their own group isn't that the bats are here too. I I refuse to believe that the person who made this thought bats were birds, so I guess they just took the flying in the name as the type, but things like Charizard and Dragonite aren't in here, so... Uh... Okay, field. Why are there so many Pokemon in here? Can everything that lives out in a field just breed for some reason? We've got mammals, we've got reptiles, we've got birds, we've got amphibians, we've got... nuts. Human leg is actually one of the better ones, because it's built around some consistent physiological characteristics that could actually show ancestry. But Volbeat and Illumise are human-like? Graplocked? Bug is a nice haven. Other than Shuckle, which I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not an arthropod. Nothing here is dumb. Though crustaceans like Kingler and Crawdont should be in here, since insects are more closely related to crustaceans than they are to spiders, and we have Dwebble in here anyways, so... And Water 3. I like Water 3. Though it collapses a massive number of phylum, turning it into basically the non-bug invertebrate category, you kind of do need an other category. And this fits that bill. 
Plus, I just generally like these sorts of... Uh, who the f*** put Caracosta and Archaeops in here? Who saw that most of the other fossils were in here and thought, Oh, it must be where the fossil Pokemon go! I... <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, anyways, so as I was saying, Pokemon can hybridize with a wide range of other Pokemon. Well, actually they can't. Uh, Pokemon hybridization is very minor, because the species is entirely determined by the mother. Uh, this is where things are gonna go off the rails. Okay, I'm not a geneticist. Uh, I mean, I'm not an ecologist either, but there's a difference between applying basic ecology concepts and proposing a genetic model, but to me, as a single step above a layman, basically, this makes me think that the males have far less of an impact on the genes of their children than the females. If, for example, all Pokemon had 20 diploid chromosomes, and the males gave their half for 5, not all 20, that could justify something like species being determined by the mother and the ability to reproduce outside of their species. The other 15 would then be asexually reproduced by the mother in some manner. This means that mutations could happen on a good portion of the chromosomes without changing whether two species are compatible. Although for the scale we see, that portion the males give might have to be very small. It does somewhat negate the whole benefit of having sexual reproduction anyways, that being the ability to cross over beneficial genes quickly amongst a population. It means that Pokemon would sort of be halfway between sexual and asexual reproduction, which is probably the worst of both worlds. Additionally, it would have a whole bunch of consequences on the sexual dynamic. Males would not be able to pass on all their genes, and I'm not sure what that would exactly entail. Uh, maybe the weird ratios we see? More likely, they would be very inclined to protect their sisters. It also means that female Pokemon shouldn't really care about what species they mate with. Just a lot of problems. Okay, slightly shifted idea. Rather than pass on only a handful, what if the male did pass over a whole set of chromatids, but for each one that isn't compatible, the female replaces it with a fully asexually reproduced chromosome? When Pokemon of the same species mate, it's just like real life. The child has 50% of its genes from each parent. But when the species are different, they only get a portion from their father, and the rest is filled up by the mother. This could explain both the fact that the species is determined by the mother, and that Pokemon can widely reproduce. This would mean that Pokemon would usually want to reproduce within their species, or as close to it as they can get, but if need be, they could reproduce outside of it. The fathers want this because the farther they get from their species, the less of their genes get passed on. The mothers also still want this because the farther they are from their species, the more like asexual reproduction it is, and as I said, it's probably the worst of both worlds scenario. But if you can't find your own species, it's better than your genes just dying off. Notably, there's room for females potentially wanting to reproduce outside their species, because they do give more of their own genes into that child in that case, meaning the female lean species could be explained by this hypothesis, in that they've taken a route approaching asexual reproduction. The male leaning ones are still a problem though. So back to the egg groups. With this idea in mind, that Pokemon can sort of fill in the gaps when reproducing with different species, what causes Pokemon to become unable to reproduce? If the groups formed a tree shape, as in there was a clear lineage going on, then I may suggest genetic change, but it's not a tree, it's a web. Any male Pokemon can be any other Pokemon's grandfather. So instead of genetic incompatibility, it's probably prezygotic incompatibility, as in these Pokemon could reproduce, they just won't or physically cannot. This could be due to a mismatch of parts, sperms poorly suited to the environment of the other species' womb, or simply a lack of desire to mate with them, as we see from the breeder's comments of things along the lines of, they don't seem to care about each other. This physiological explanation for the egg groups also removes the issue of them being filled with a whole bunch of different Pokemon because the behavior and physical ability to mate are much more easily convergently evolved than the compatibility of genes for reproduction. That's another question off the list, but the males are still a burning one. 
Okay, I, I'm just going to accept the male leaning species as something that arises from the unique genetic mechanics of Pokemon. It could theoretically, I guess, function, so I'm just going to accept it. But the 100% male species are unavoidable as a problem. It really is a riddle. We need to figure out a reason for how these species can reproduce, despite them not being able to. Of course, they can reproduce with Ditto, so there is a way for them to do it and make an egg, and it isn't asexual. And they definitely are at least male, because they can reproduce with females of other species. I've thought of a number of solutions, but the following I think is the least problematic one. They're sequential hermaphrodites, species that started as one sex and then at some point, under certain circumstances, can transition into the other. They start off as males, allowing them to reproduce with other Pokemon. When they grow older, somewhat weaker and probably unsuited for Pokemon battles, they become female, allowing them to reproduce with younger members of their species or other Pokemon. The females are thus not used by trainers, rarely ran into in the wild, and not attainable directly from eggs. The weaker point is kind of needed because I, I think the best way to explain no trainers having them is that they retire them from battling when they grow older and when they're female consequently. The problem with the solution is that we don't see any real direct evidence for it, but it stands out in that it doesn't have any major assumptions we need to make in order to accept it as possible. The biggest assumption is that hermaphroditism rose at all, which there are real life animals that are sequentially hermaphroditic, so it's possible. But on top of that, it kind of fits well with logic I've come up with. As I said, females might have an inclination to only reproduce outside their species, since it means more of their genes get passed on. The disadvantage of this is that if those genes aren't very effective for survival, then you get less fit offspring. If for a female to exist, they need to survive for many years, then a female has, more so than usual, proven their fitness. A female member of these species might actually prefer to mate outside of their species, because it means most of their genes get passed on. Again, with little evidence, this is probably the most iffy of my hypotheses, uh, and I really want someone to find something better, but until then, this is the best I can do. Alright, time to take a little break with the simpler issue. Every Pokemon hatches from an egg. We got no Amniotes. This is less of an issue, more of a funny little thing. With the versatility of breeding in mind, it makes sense that all Pokemon use the same sort of method of reproduction. And eggs are a pretty versatile method. Though usually aquatic creatures don't have hard ones, which kind of implies to me that Pokemon started on the land and then moved to the water, but that's a topic for some other time. It also kind of implies that all Pokemon come onto land to lay their eggs, which, considering how fish are able to fight Pokemon battles on land, that guess that tracks. The other thing is that most Pokemon come out of the egg basically fully formed. We have to assume they don't come out at full size and that there are some differences between this and the adult. Again, the egg stuff is pretty minor. They probably shouldn't all look the same though, but again, whatever. And let's go straight back in to a really tough one. Sexless Pokemon. Are they really sexless? Sort of. Uh, it for the most part doesn't really matter but I think they are effectively all female. With the models I've proposed, it seems like Pokemon, specifically female leaning species, are approaching asexual reproduction. The sexless species are ones that have made that jump and do reproduce asexually. Great, so why can they reproduce with Ditto? Okay, well, evolution isn't just big jumps, it's gradual. While they have the ability to reproduce asexually, they may not have fully lost the ability to do so sexually. They probably lack the behaviors to encourage them to do so, but Ditto's oddly aphrodisiac properties get past that, I suppose. Additionally, asexual reproduction probably works a little differently than the sexual. Maybe there's no egg, for example. So if your Pokemon does reproduce in the daycare, the offspring kind of just goes off. <laughs> Not all sexless Pokemon can reproduce with Ditto though. Unknown, for example, likely are derived enough to have lost the ability to reproduce sexually, and thus Ditto can do nothing with them. However, I don't think this is the case for all sexless Pokemon. Most legendaries are sexless, and the thing is, one of the biggest advantages of asexuality is the ability to reproduce quickly and without expending as much energy. 
We'd expect asexual Pokémon to be common, or at least like unknown, where their range is limited, but they're very prevalent within said range. Legendaries are naturally extremely rare, so for them, I think rather than being asexual, they probably are sexed. However, their sexless denotation comes from both a lack of knowledge and a lack of fecundity. A combination of being very picky and having very specific mating habits would mean that just tossing them in the daycare wouldn't really do much, and in this case I guess even Ditto wouldn't be able to convince them otherwise. This would also explain why they're so rare. They just don't breed as much and thus are not very common at all. And then, due to this rareness, they haven't been able to be studied much. Because of that, it's not really known how to sex them. At least not all of them. There are of course a few that do have known sexes, but still cannot reproduce. This alludes to the idea that yes, they might all have sexes, we just are still discovering them. So that's the major strokes. I think that covers most of the oddities of the breeding system. In conclusion, Pokemon are not animals. Their reproductive system seems to work very differently. The fact that their ability to reproduce is very minimally affected by evolutionary change show that there's something different going on under the hood. My explanations have been trying to apply how real life animals work to Pokemon, and that's what kind of creates these four solutions. Though that's the best I can really do before designing a whole unique genetic system, which I will not and cannot do. So yeah, this has all led me to the belief that in the world of Pokemon, there are Pokemon and there are animals, the latter of which include humans, as probably two different kingdoms. Actually, scratch that. I think there's a good chance that Pokemon and Eukaryotes are different things. I think Pokemon may be that different. Maybe they come from a completely different origin of life. Perhaps another planet. Who knows? The takeaway is that they are very different from us. And going forward in my Pokemon Ecology series, I'll be using some conclusions I made in this video to make points about certain relatedness and concepts. Thanks for watching. This is sort of part of my Pokemon Ecology series where I'm looking at, well, the ecology of the Pokemon games and hypothesizing it based on the mechanics of the world and Pokemon. This is just a large topic, so I decided to put it in its own video. So if that series sounds interesting, then I guess go check it out. If you have any thoughts on the plausibility of my hypotheses, share them in the comments. I always enjoy feedback. Oh, I didn't talk about the plants. I didn't talk about the plants. I'll talk about the plants next time.